and welcome to the land of Lincoln, the home of Honest Abe. This is Springfield, Illinois. It is the capital of the state and the home of the Illinois State Fairgrounds, which in turn is home to one of the classic motorcycle events in all of American dirt track racing. The Springfield Mile has attracted thousands of motorcycle enthusiasts for a day at the races. All the big names are here, including the series point leader, Chris Carr. You come to Springfield and you're coming to the fastest mile there is in the world. I tell you, it could it could run up, be rough. It could uh, smooth out, and be fast. It's one of those things that's hard to hard to tell. But I'm thinking it's going to end up being a fast track, uh, running three, four abreast in the corner, and uh, that's that's what we want. Heavy rains prompt those questions about the track conditions, but on Sunday morning, the skies are sunny, and the Campbell Pro Series Championship battle is ready to resume, with Carr leading Parker by three. Jay Springsteen, third in the points. Yeah, he's 20 back of Parker, but nonetheless, it's good to see the Springer in the top five. Parker, the series champ, yucks it up with his kid teammate Kevin Atherton, despite the fact that they got clobbered in qualifying. Looky here, the Hondas of Terry Poovey and Dan Ingram were the only two uh, motorcycles in the 100 mile an hour range, qualifying at better than 35 seconds. Here, Jay and Carr having a laugh and thinking, hey, we'll get them come race time, and indeed it is race time. We're going to move right now into heat race number one. There is your fast qualifier, Poovey, on the outside pole. He'll be challenged by Chris Carr and Jay Springsteen, the Harley factory team rolling out heavy hitters to deal with the Hondas right off the bat. As they power out of turn two, Poovey takes the lead coming around the outside. Mertens, number 53, will come with him. At 130 miles an hour, we're racing at Springfield. up to third challenges the hondas up front he has car in tow in fourth spot out of turn four they come to complete lap one the top three will advance out of this first 10 lap heat race directly into the championship main event mertens tries to hang on to the draft of Poovy. Poovy taking off the effects of a dislocated shoulder that he suffered at ascot park a couple of races back He's feeling pretty well, and it shouldn't bother him too badly here today on the mile. Inside move by Mertens. Carr, number 20, slides past Springsteen on the inside. And give a call to Will Davis in the white leathers. He is fifth on the racetrack. He had the whole shot, but couldn't make it stick. Mertens out of turn two, lap two, has put Poovy behind him. Poovy on the Marino Racing Honda looks inside, makes the dive. Mertens grabs a handful, but can't retaliate. And Poovy retakes the lead as Carr moves up to challenge. Two Hondas, then two Harleys as they stream out of turn number two and down the back stretch, opening up a separation on number 21 Davis and a brief glimpse there of Teddy Taylor, number 75. He is no longer in it. Carr moves up and splits the Hondas, taking over the second spot from Tim Mertens. Mertens, the 28-year-old campaigner from Belleville, Illinois, now working on the factory Harley of Chris Carr. Here they go, three wide. Mertens looks inside. Carr has got the good line. And Chris Carr marches in two laps from fourth to first. Now that demonstrates why he is the Campbell Pro Series point leader. He won the opening mile of the year in Sacramento, California. Mertens will not roll over and play dead, nor will Poovey. Here he comes, great inside move, and Poovey will retake the lead just like that car is back to third. Springsteen, the fourth place man, four riders going for three transfer spots. Only the top three will advance. Somebody out of this pack will have to go to the semifinal if they continue to run in this four-man formation. They are past the halfway point, and so the feeling out begins here. Who's got what? Who can make the move where? How am I going to get into that top three and avoid being the odd man out? Mertens looks inside. Carr looked outside. Had an ocean. Booby took his line. Carr had to back off. Springsteen maybe showing a little smoke. Mertens slips high, and that could be disastrous. Springsteen will have a shot at him as they come out of four. Couldn't get by. Mertens hauled it back down onto the groove. In fact, goes to the bottom as they hit turn one. Carr will hang on to the spot. That was a good effort by uh, number 53, Tim Mertens, who could have lost a lot of real estate right there. 
So Carr is the leader. Pooby is second for the moment. Mertens is third. Here comes Springsteen on the outside. They stack them two by two into turn three. Jay needs to get something going here if he's going to get that direct transfer spot. He's been lurking back there, perhaps just looking these guys over for the first half of the race. And now he looks like he wants to mount a challenge around the outside, but everywhere he tries to go, someone else is already occupying the spot. Carr the leader, Pooby second, Mertens third, and Springer slipping and sliding around at the top of the groove, stuck in fourth spot, and that's not good for a transfer. That'll send him to the semi if he can't uh, make some sort of advance here. Three wide into turn three. Pooby retakes the lead from Carr. No clear-cut favorite has emerged here. Nobody seems to have superior drafting capability over anybody else. Another big bobble by Mertens as he tries to hang on to the fleeing Marino Honda and Factory Harley that have set the pace here for the last couple of laps. Carr regaining the advantage from Poovey seems perhaps to have the front straightaway covered, and Poovey seems to be able to do the drafting on the back chute. Now, whether or not uh, that is a pattern that will continue remains to be seen. Four wide, Springsteen says it's time to go. Wheels around the outside of Carr, can he make it stick? Now the Harleys are stuck at the back. Mertens went all the way to the lead with that move. They know it's getting down and dirty. We're coming to the white flag. Only one lap to do your business. Poovey retakes the lead as they come by the white flag. And here's Springer trying to get all the way to the lead. He was just sitting back there with the cruise control on, I guarantee you. Knew the white flag was coming. Counted down those laps as it's time to go. Again, they're four wide. Who's going to come out the loser? Poovey's got the spot. Off turn four, final time. Springsteen pressured by Carr. It'll be a four-man dash to the checkered flag. Three transfer spots. Everybody's up to see how this one's going to end. Down they come. Checkered flag. Ooh, I don't know. That is close. It looks like Poovey got it by inches over Carr with Springsteen third. Unbelievable. Tim Burton is the man who was aced out. Great heat race. Let's hear from the winner. Poovey, what a race. What a performance. How'd you win it? I don't know. I just want to do it 25 times in the main event. I'm ready. Let's go. How bad are you hurting anyway? Oh, I'm not hurting at all. I just got, you know, it hurts a little bit when I get off the motorcycle, but when I'm racing, I don't even think about it. When they all came at you on the last lap, did you have a strategy in mind or was it just gas it up and go? I knew they were right there, and I said, I'm going to hold this thing on longer than they are going in here, and that's what happened. He held it on longer, and he won the race. A great performance. Congratulations, Terry Poovey. Heat race number one was a dogfight. Heat race number two is up and coming. And this time we'll have Danny Ingram pond on the pole. Scott Parker alongside. Parker gets his traditional not-so-hot start. In fact, he's going to be almost at the back of this pack. Joe Roeder grabs second place through turn two. Out onto the back stretch they go. Ingram showing the way. Up into third spot at Scott Stump, number 77. Mike Hale, the rookie, number 12, is fourth. And here comes Ather to take that spot away. Then number one, Parker, way back in the pack with some real catching up to do. The national champion, three points back in the Campbell Pro standings, sixth on the racetrack as Ingram puts lap one in the book. Inside move by Parker. He'll pick off two as they go to turn one. He gets around Roeder and the rookie Hale and takes over fourth spot. Next in Scotty Sainz will be the 77 of Scott Stump. He looks outside to make the move on Stump. He doesn't want to let his teammate Atherton and his arch rival, that Honda of Danny Ingram, get away. Parker knew he had to dispose of the traffic quickly after the bad start. Otherwise, he was in danger of losing touch with the leaders. And indeed, it may be too late already because look at the lead that Ingram has filled up. Atherton and Parker have added. Here's the kid, Hale. He's up to fourth. Junior national champion, number 12, running for rookie of the year this year. Parker will challenge Atherton off turn two. Now, if they get to battling each other side by side, it's going to be a huge break for Ingram, who will be able to continue to stretch that lead. Inside move by Parker. He grabs the spot. Says, come on, kid, keep up with me. Atherton learning a lot of his dirt track racing lessons from Parker. And as they head down the front straight, well, it looks like Scotty's messing with his motorcycle there. He was actually reaching across the gas tank toward the left, uh, the right-hand side of the uh, motorcycle, reaching across with his left hand as he came down the straightaway. I'm not sure what that's all about. Let's see if it happens again. He's still looking down. Parker may have a problem here, but he is closing in on Ingram. Anything that is hampering Parker's progress, 
but it remains a little bit of a mystery. We'll watch and see if it happens again this time. Here is Ingram out onto the front straightaway. This time Parker in the uh, traditional tuck, down on the gas tank, left hand, down on the forks, and uh, whatever it was appears to be okay now. You see how the interval has shifted. Parker, just a lap ago, was closer to Atherton than he was to Ingram. That has certainly changed now. Atherton, on the other hand, is not uh, able to gain anything on Parker. Here is Hale running fourth. And look at the battle for fifth, sixth, and seventh. Audie Huff on the tail end of the pack, number 51, challenging Scott Stump and Joe Roeder. Stump and Roeder have done some racing together. They both come out of Ohio. Parker closing in on Ingram. I believe he's going to catch him. Ingram looks to be gone. Parker has reeled him in. Catching him is one thing. Passing him is another. Parker looks to the outside. Ingram down hugging the inside of that blue groove. Parker running the typical higher line. Takes it all the way out close to the wall. Here's the challenge down the back stretch. Ingram flicks her in. Parker takes it to the outside. Can he get around? Yes. Parker pulls off the fast. And Ingram now has company. Ingram may not have known Parker was coming, but he certainly knows he's there now. And Atherton, meanwhile, is indeed closing, and we're down to the last lap. White flag out. Ingram says, I'm not going to let you have it easily, Scotty. He retakes the lead. Here comes Atherton. He's going to make a three-rider fight out of this as they go down the backstretch. Parker in the middle. Two Harleys chase the Honda down the chute. Final time. Inside move, Atherton. Atherton gets around Parker. He'll make the run, perhaps, at Ingram on the final lap. Parker gets singed by his young teammate, and as they swap spots, Ingram tries to get away. Here they come, dash to the checkered flag. Ingram's got him beat. Ingram beats the Harleys of Atherton and Parker. The Hondas are two for two. Let's hear from the winner. They came up and gave you some trouble there at the end, didn't they? Yeah, I got, got a good start and set the pace there, and uh, I didn't know if they were going to catch me or not. I never did look back, but the Aiken Sponsor Show is sponsored. Uh, Honda Bloomington bike was just running great, and uh, hopefully we'll be there in the main event. Once they came up there and caught you, did you have to change your strategy to win this thing? Well, I mean, you were back in second spot for a while. Well, I didn't really get to race with them, so I didn't know if I could beat them to the start-finish line or not. And they didn't pass me down the back straightaway, so I just took my chances and let it off the fourth corner. Can you come back and win the main event? It's feeling awful good. All right, there's a man who sounds pretty confident. Danny Ingram wins it on that Skip Eakin prepared Honda as we go to heat race number three. The Harley factory team has been shut out thus far. Let's see if the privateer Harley riders want to move on. Moorhead, Steve Moorhead gets a whole shot as he takes the early lead here from Billy Herndon, number 19. Moorhead riding the Gardner Law, Will Harley Davidson, and Herndon on the HUD Racing Honda. And here comes Keith Bay up to challenge from third spot. He'll go all the way to the lead. The pole sitter, number 58, Dave Durrell, did not get a very good start. And he rides fifth right behind Donnie Eastep as the lead quintet try to break away. Day has opened up a pretty healthy separation as Steve Ferracci gives him the green flag indicating that the start was clean and they are indeed racing for four position. Five guys racing for three spots in fact. Same drill here in heat race number three. The top three advance to the main event and the uh, fourth and fifth place riders in fact four through ninth are bound for the semi. Here comes Moorhead around Herndon. Moorhead the veteran 34 years old. Riding the Harley Davidson back on Harley this year after a season on Honda. In fact, last year he rode the stable mate to Danny Ingram's number 31 that we just saw victorious in heat race number two. Moorhead challenging Keith Day. Day down on the bottom. Moorhead choosing to go just a little bit higher. Mert Lawwell, the tuner on that number 42 machine with a tremendous amount of riding experience himself. He builds full and fast motorcycles. They have a little bit of a reputation for not finishing races. Moorhead was leading Sacramento earlier this year, but the bike swallowed a valve and failed to finish. And then at San Jose, he was involved in an incredible battle for second, lost the brakes on the last lap, and settled for fifth. Now here he battles with Keith Day. Carbon copy of the last lap. Day on the bottom, Moorhead on the top. Herndon is third. Durrell is fourth. They've broken away from East Step, and it looks like once again we'll see four riders battling for three positions. Herndon inside. Oh, did you see Moorhead reach over and slap Keith Day on the thigh? 
I'm not sure whether that was Moorhead uh, just playing games or if he was concerned. Watch it. There's the slap. I think Moorhead saw Herndon coming up the inside, feared that they might move over and thought, I'm just going to let O'Keefe know I'm here. Reached over, slapped him on the thigh at 120 miles an hour, and then they cocked him into the corner. Here comes Moorhead, now the leader, up the straightaway. These guys are amazing. The, the trust, the confidence they have in each other, running at those kinds of speeds. Moorhead moves around now to take the lead as Day settles into that second spot. Herndon and Durrell in danger of losing touch with the two front runners. Durrell comes charging right back up. Now they pick up the draft. And they're still very much in the thick of it. Day retakes the advantage over Moorhead. Good battle between a couple of veterans with Herndon and Durrell right on their heels. And now Durrell is around Herndon into third. Durrell making a move. This guy's ready to rock and roll. He weighs about 120 pounds, ringing wet. And he figures, I'm going to get up there and mix it up with these guys. He was the pole sitter and the third fastest qualifier of the day. He did not get a great start. He's had to work his way into contention. And now they go three wide. Herndon looking for a place to wedge in there. Can't find one. Has to settle for fourth for the moment as Moorhead flips back out front. Tremendous action in this heat. Once again, it's four riders going for three spots. Down the front straightaway, they hammer. And again, Durrell makes that inside move on Keith Day. He wants to get out there, hook up with Moorhead, and see if the two of them can't break away. I don't think Day is going to allow that to happen. The two Harleys lead the two Hondas out onto the backstretch. Moorhead seems to have the advantage here. They make the inside move on him. Let's see if they'll get by. Moorhead runs right in on the top of the racetrack and seems to be able to hold his line a little bit better. He comes down across the front of him, gives them plenty of racing group, but I don't think they've got anything for Moorhead on the last lap. We'll see. Watch him try to prove me wrong. Durrell looks inside. That time there was nothing there. Day was not able to draft by. Moorhead has not been able to for the last couple of laps. They'll come down the backstretch. Moorhead, I think, has the stronger motorcycle. Let's see what happens here. Day goes inside. Durrell looks outside. Moorhead lets him go. Comes in right behind Keith Day now. We'll try to draft him back by as they come off turn four. Here they come. Here's the slingshot, and it's Moorhead. Moorhead wins it over Keith Day. Dave Durrell will take the third spot. Let's find out if Moorhead was so confident that he just let Keith Day go. You old fox, you played with him, didn't you? Shit, no, he never played with him. I just, I balls him, I guess. I was trying to get my motorcycle to work around the high groove, and, and I talked to Jay. I said, Jay, where do you run? He says, I passed him in the mid three and four going high. I said, okay, Springer. So I just, you know, I took Jay's advice, and I tried the high groove, and it worked down there. But thank God I'm back on a Harley Davidson. This Gardner Lowell KK team's just working awful good. And I want to thank you people for coming. All right, here's heat race number four. Thunder at Springfield. This will be our final 10-lap qualifier, and as they head out onto the backstretch, Ronnie Jones is the leader on the Honda, and his challenger is number 57. That is Rusty Rogers on the Harley-Davidson, a young man who's uh, had a pretty good couple of weeks here on the Camel Pro Series trail. Number 92, Rodney Ferris, closing in from third spot, and the three of them have already a, uh, made a breakaway that uh, may enable them to go off and settle this thing by themselves. Jones moves inside on Rogers, who's kind of slipping and twitching a little bit there in the number two position. Thus far, we've seen a lot of four-man races going for three spots. This one looks like three guys just trying to decide the win among them. And the guy who appears for the moment to be most hungry is number 92, Ferris. The protege of Gary Nixon slides inside of Ronnie Jones and takes over the lead. He's riding the Walter Brothers Harley Davidson as he's challenged up the front straightaway by Ronnie Jones on that George Garvis Honda Town entry. Rusty Rogers now losing his grip a little bit on the two leaders as Jones and Ferris seesaw down the backstretch. Jones taking the lead up the front straightaway and Ferris taking the lead down the back. As they go into turn number three, it is Ferris once again making the better dive into the corner and grabbing the spot away from the veteran Jones. 
out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And here you see how the gap has opened up over the 57 machine of Rusty Rogers. He's doing his best to try to hang on thus far unsuccessfully. And once again, Jones up the front straightaway made the pass right around the start finish line. It's the classic draft pass. And at Springfield, the start finish line is directly in the middle of that straightaway. Rogers. Seems to be having a little trouble with the back end hopping around on him, and that's costing him traction, and in turn, costing him ground. See the interval as they come to the halfway flag, and again, Jones is past Ferris at the start-finish line, and that is the key. The pattern in this race seems to be pretty clear-cut. As Rogers tries to keep up, Ronnie Jones owns the front straightaway, and if the pattern holds, Ferris will draft by him going into turn three, and indeed, there he does. But that won't do Ferris any good. You've got to lead it at start finish. And Rodney thus far has not been able to do that. Hot Rod gets Zephard right here, coming down the front straightaway every time. Rogers running uh, third with uh, no discernible opportunity here to catch up. If anything, I think he's losing a little ground. He's riding a Honda here today. He's been on and off a variety of different motorcycles in uh, two or three races preceding this one. Ferris diving in on Jones. Every lap, it seems to be the same, and Jones is certainly uh, loving that, if you will, because he is the guy who's leading this finish line. If this pattern continues, he is destined to win the race. Now, this time, Ferris has a little more advantage, but once again, Jones is able to nip past at the start-finish line. Perhaps what Ferris should do is let Jones go one lap down the backstretch and see if he can reverse the order here. Rodney needs to lead it, not coming down this straightaway, but indeed going down the other one. But once again, Ferris takes to the inside. I think really Jones is letting him go. Jones is sliding wide at the entrance to the corner and maybe even rolling off a little bit early. You saw Jones look back right there to make sure it's just the two of them. And there you see at the white flag, Jones makes the draft pass right at start finish. All right, well, Ferris try to cross him up on this, the final lap. If Rodney chooses to pass him down the straightaway going into three, as he has every lap up until now, I fear he will be a sitting duck at start finish. Sure enough, there he goes. Ferris is determined that he can lead Jones down that final straightaway one time in this race and do it on the money lap. I'm not sure there's much reason to think that Ferris can do that. Indeed, here comes Jones, and Jones has got him at the start finish line. Ferris will be second, Rusty Rogers third. Let's ask Ronnie Jones, where do you want to be on that last lap? The leader or second and in position to draft? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, we probably want to, if we're close enough, we want to be second. We don't want to be second if somebody is straight away in front of us, but they're right in front of us. We want to be second. And, and today this Garbazon is working pretty good. And I think it's about time we try to win one of these Camel Pro Series miles. You're due to win a Springfield, don't you think? Yeah, I think I am. This one is probably my favorite track all season, so I'm really wanting to do, uh, really like to win it here. Good luck to you. Thank you, Dave. That's Ronnie Jones coming home a winner in heat race number four. Indeed, the Hondas have won three of the four heats. Here's Scott Parker, the Camel Pro champion, trying to do something about that. He's uh, talking things over with his mechanic, Willie Werner. Scotty is the star of our Camel Pro Grand National Flashback. Going to take you back one week. Look at this. This is Camel Challenge action down the front straightaway at San Jose. Parker is dead last. They go six wide. Parker passes the field going into turn number one. That is for $10,000 to win. Now they come down to the finish, and Parker is drafted by Kevin Atherton. His young teammate slides by going into turn three. Out of turn four, the kid has a shot at his first $10,000 check. Parker ain't going to let that happen. He tucks into the draft, zings him back as they come down to the start-finish line. Parker, with a breathtaking move, takes the victory. Atherton's going to have to wait his turn. We talked to Kevin about that. If that race ran again today, do you think you could beat him, or would he find another trick? I don't know. Uh, I think I'd beat him. I'd give her a good shot. Do you learn from situations like that? I mean, do you file something away there and think, okay, next time I know what I'm going to do differently? And how often do those circumstances come up when you really figure, okay, I learned something from that? They happen just about every weekend, and I have all week to think about it. You know, I, I sat in the truck on the way home, and I thought, man, why did I do that? And then next time, I won't do it. I learn a lot. 
As a young man with a great future in this game. We're back to the action here with the first of two semifinals. Into turn one they go. Scott Stump side by side with Tim Mertens on a pair of Hondas. Oh, we got trouble. It is Joe Roeder off his motorcycle and on the ground. And that motorcycle stood right back up on its wheels and kept going. Let's take a look at a replay here. Rotor is at the left side of your screen, number 66, white leathers. A little bit of a wiggle in the front end as he hits to the corner. He just lost the rear there. It steps out. Now watch that bike come back up on its wheels and keep going. Joe's on the ground. He hears the motorcycle running down the racetrack, looks up and says, what is going on here? And then sees it hit the fence. Now looks around to see if anybody's going to hit him. All right, we're back to the action now. Up front, it is Mertens. Heading down the back chute, chased by the number 21 of Willie Davis. Davis dives inside. This proves to be something of a snake bit semifinal. You got just a glimpse of the 51 of Audie Hoff right there. Now watch what happens to Huff. Boom! Into the wall as he went a tumbling. And again, we have another angle of this that we can show you. Watch the right hand side of your screen as Huff comes off big time. He was not badly injured here. Here's a slow mo replay, and there you see. He just lost the thing and went over the handlebars, and the bike really smacked the wall. Huff like a rag doll, but other than some bruises, he was uninjured. Back to the action now, and it turned out to be a three-rider battle for two transfer positions out of the semi. Mertens, Davis, and the rookie Mike Hale to decide it here in the final lap. Davis coming out of the turn four with the lead. Mertens trying to draft him. White flag waiting. Mike Hale, the rookie, looks inside, tries to come out of the draft and pick up a spot. Mertens will lead it going to turn one. Hale, the junior national champion, consistently making main events this year. He bobbles, ooh, and he bobbles again coming out of two. That will probably cost him a shot at the leaders. I don't know if he can make up this ground down the final straightaway. Davis looking inside on the Harley and manages to grab the lead away from Mertens. Mertens will try to draft him back up the other straightaway. They are pulling away from Hale, and indeed, Mike's going to settle for third. Side by side they go. Give the spot to Mertens. He wins it on the Honda over the Harley-Davidson of Will Davis, and that's going to send Mike Hale into the last chance qualifier. Mertens and Davis get the two transfer spots. Now we'll show you the highlight of the second semifinal. It was all decided on the last lap. Number 19, Billy Hearn, the runaway leader. Look at the four-man fight for the remaining transfer spot. That is Brian Atherton, number 98, with second spot for the moment, challenged by Doug Davis, number 41. The number 50 is uh, Kurt Raymond, and 33 is Dave Hebb. And they are working all out on the last lap. Davis slides wide. Here comes the number 19 of Herndon to win it. And hustling out of that three-rider pack, Ryan Atherton takes that transfer spot. He coming back from a broken neck last year. It's great to see him back in competition. He'll be in the feature here this afternoon. We're going to show you the last chance qualifier outcome and settle the 17th starting spot in the main event. As they come off the line and head down to turn number one, a little bit of a problem there. Number 75, Teddy Taylor, and number 50, Kurt Raymond, along with 64, Bobby Dameron, all jump the start. Interesting angle there as they blast off from the penalty line. Last chance qualifier led at lap one by Mike Hale with the challenge up the inside by Doug Davis. Davis will take the spot as they go to turn number two. A pair of Harley Davidsons here as they break away. Remember now, only the winner of this race moves on. You gotta win it to get into the feature. Good battle among all the guys who have not yet qualified. Hale squirts to the front, takes the spot away from Davis. Scott Stump comes up to challenge for third. Down the front straight away they come and you see Hale begin to open it up just a little bit. He's not looking back, but he'd be tickled to death to see those two guys behind him battling side by side for second spot because that'll slow him down a little bit. Stump on the Honda breaks out of that battle with the second place man, number 75, Taylor, and takes the lead momentarily from Mike Hale. So currently Hale is sandwiched between the Hondas. They get the cross flags indicating halfway. And to the front straightaway, Hale has the better position in the draft, retakes the spot from Stump. Stump was last year's Rookie of the Year. Hale is determined to claim those honors this year. And Teddy Taylor begins to struggle a little bit now as Hale pulls out, pulls away, and uh, gains an easy victory here in the last chance. He's
He's got the 17th starting spot in the main event. Everybody else is done for the day.